Merrimack TV, are you ready? All right. Good evening. Welcome to the December 20th, 2021 Merrimack School Board meeting. Please join me and rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Next up is public participation. Welcome everyone to tonight's meeting. Um, it was decided uh, not too long ago, a year ago or so, it's been kind of the COVID thing that we would accept residents to submit public comments via email. To do this, you may submit email to public comment at sau26.org. Again, the email is public comment at sau26.org. We do require your name and address for the record as if you were in person. Based on the amount of information tonight, we always decide um, we're either going to read all or nothing. So we'll read it off verbatim, but if the volume becomes too much, um, we may have to just include them in the notes. Otherwise, we'll plan to read everything. What we've been doing the last several meetings is allowing public comments from the public and then um, what we have in our email box, and we'll continue to do that um, for tonight's meeting as well. I do have a few ground rules. Um, we're all neighbors. We all live in the same community. Please be respectful. Um, please be clear and concise, uh, whether in person or email, please keep your comments concise and be clear about what you're asking of the board. Please also direct your comments directly to the board. Um, we do ask that you keep your comments um, to a minimum to ensure that everyone can speak. Um, this is a business meeting. Please speaking out of turn or interrupting will not be tolerated. Also, um, when residents, you know, again, when residents come to the microphone, please state your name and address for the record. Um, also, we will not allow any public disparagement of any of our district employees or school board members. If any comments appear to cross that line, I will just simply ask you to step away from the microphone. Um, that's it. So I will go ahead and open up public comments. Um, oh, and I'll, one last thing. If there are any students, I don't see, doesn't look like I see any students, but if there are, um, just state your name and that you're a student. You don't need the address, and that would go for any public comments that we would receive in the email box as well. So I'll, I will open it up to public comments. Any public comments? All right. Email? None. Wow. Okay. Then um, from here, we will go on to recognitions. Are there any recognitions? Today? Well, I'd like to um, recognize a um, preschool teacher at Thornton's Ferry, uh, Melissa Terry, who has uh, completed 18 graduate uh, credit certificate program through Endicott College. Did I say Thornton's Ferry? Reeds Ferry, I'm sorry. I skipped ahead of myself. At uh, Reeds Ferry, uh, she has completed a, a program in applied behavior analysis. Uh, she's also completed 1,500 hours of supervised practice in uh, ABA and uh, passed the board certification exam. So she is now uh, qualified to become a board certified behavior analyst. And that is a very important position in a school system. So we congratulate uh, Melissa for that uh, achievement. Um, also, you know, I received a nice uh, email from from uh, Bonnie at uh, Reeds Ferry about um, some of the feedback from parents on substitute teachers that we have and very positive in nature. And one of them uh, is a, uh, a person who not only serves the town but serves the state, Rosemary Rung. Uh, she has received a nice compliment from several parents about her kindness and her effectiveness in the uh, in the classroom. So we congratulate all of our uh, parents and uh, volunteers in the community who are substituting. Uh, and also, uh, Rosemary, I want to uh, shout out to her for not only providing service to us in the legislature, but also now in her hometown as a substitute teacher. The Thornton's Ferry Parent Organization has raised $27,000 and that will be contributed to a new, more inclusive uh, and accessible playground. And so we congratulate that as an extraordinary effort. And we congratulate the parents and the teachers uh, for raising that much money to provide a very important upgrade to a very important piece of equipment in a school environment. Um, a playground is very important to 
gross and fine motor skill development as well as socialization skills uh, of students. And so thank you to the Thornton's Ferry parents and teachers. From Steve Clare at the high school, um, uh, the Random Acts of Kindness a student group has 40 blankets that will be hung on a fence at Veterans Park in Manchester on the morning of December 24th. Uh, the blankets are hung, uh, and each one having an individual note of hope and love and signed by the Merrimack High School students. So an outstanding, outstanding gesture. The High School Giving Tree has raised several thousands of dollars in gift donations to assist families in Merrimack during this season of giving, uh, so we congratulate them on that. I want to thank the police department for their extraordinary presence last Friday. As you know, there was um, much to do about uh, nationwide about uh, possible acts of school violence. Uh, fortunately, it did not happen here. Um, and I want to say that you know Kim and I and others and Matt were around in the schools uh, throughout the day. And every time I was in a school, I saw an officer from the Merrimack Police Department displaying kindness, uh, displaying passion and calmness, talking with students, talking with staff, and the staff appreciated it greatly. So thank you, thank you, thank you to the Merrimack Police Department. Um, I want to thank Melissa Faslick, our HR Director for working with Rite Aid. Uh, as of this morning when I talked with Melissa, there were over 300 participants in the vaccination clinic uh, last Saturday that was uh, run in partnership with Rite Aid. And so thank you to Rite Aid, thank you to Melissa for organizing that particular effort. Um, we uh, have just seen the application deadline close for the assistant principal position at the um, middle school. We will start reviewing those applications tomorrow morning and uh, see who we have for applicants and the quality of the applicants that we have, and we will keep you informed. Uh, we'll have a first meeting uh, this week, uh, my first meeting at least, with the, a group of administrators in terms of administrative evaluation process. Uh, there's been a lot of work done on that in the past, and we'll, I'll look to uh, be brought up to speed on that and uh, bring in some information of my own uh, so that we can work collaboratively um, uh, towards uh, a, a good uh, evaluation instrument. And finally, um, I want to take this opportunity to wish all of you, our students, our staff, and their families, and the residents of Merrimack, a very Merry Christmas and a new year filled with happiness and good health. And that is it for my update. Thank you. Okay, um, we had moved from recognitions into the superintendent update. Um, just finishing that, we're moving into the assistant superintendent for curriculum update. Thank you. Just briefly, um, as mentioned before, we have three curriculums in the process of revisions. That's the health curriculum, the social studies, and the world language. So those are all going pretty well. We have obtained Jay McTai, who is a national guru for um, the Understanding by Design or UBD design process for curriculum revisions, and he will be doing some uh, professional development for all of the administrators and um, department heads and curriculum persons um, at the end of January, and he will help launch us into a model for curriculum revisions that will hopefully, we will take online and move away from the binders and contemporize our curriculum across the board. Um, and so that will be happening at the end of January, which we're really excited about. So we have some momentum post COVID towards curriculum revisions. Thank you. Any questions from the board on that? Okay, moving on to the assistant superintendent for business update, Matt. Um, at the moment, I have nothing uh, significant to, to add to the conversation, so I'll just pass. Uh, school board update, I don't have anything um, to add specifically under this. I do have some information um, later on on an agenda item. Um, so student representative update? At the moment, I have nothing as well. Okay. All right, moving on to old business, the health and safety task force recommendation for January. Yes, uh, as you know, we um, are charged with the responsibility of 
uh, providing recommendation on uh, masking at the last meeting of every month for the following month. Uh, we met as a health and safety task force uh, about a week and a half ago. And it's our recommendation, particularly given the rise in the incidence of uh, the COVID virus uh, and the upcoming vacation period that we continue with the current policy um, in, in the month of uh, January. Uh, the state numbers from Merrimack show that we have uh, 322 new cases in the last 14 days. Um, the rate of new cases, now that's per 100,000 for comparative relative comparison purposes, is 1,217. Back in August and September, that was down around 250, 300. The uh, antigen and PCR test rate for Merrimack uh, as of the uh, 17th, that's the latest that the uh, state has posted, is 19.1%. So we think it's safest to continue with our practice. Those students whose families wish to opt them out, uh, opting out, um, our numbers um, are, are fairly good given the rate of increase in the schools uh, and in the town and the community right now with the relatively low percentages uh, of total occupants in each school uh, testing positive. So I think it's the safest, most prudent uh, decision is to continue through January and we'll keep you updated uh, through that month also. Thank you. Any questions, Jenna? I just have two two questions. My first question, I think, is fairly quickly. When we say continue as usual, we're, we mean continue with the policy, with the opt-out policy. Um, are we including to continue the piece where if any particular school goes over 5%, we will go to a two-week mandatory masking yes. for that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That, I just wanted to make sure mm -hmm. that that was a piece we were also yeah, thank moving you for forward. Asking that. Uh, my second thing was, I know that our policy states that for sporting events, masks are required. It, that's correct, right, for everybody, Ex the, except for the players that are actually playing. Is, it, that's, our, that's our policy, correct? No, the, uh, for sporting events, uh, we have not required uh, masking, uh, although we recommend it strongly on the sidelines. Right. So I, d I meant for guests, not for players. We don't oh, require uh, masking uh, for the people that come to uh, watch. Yes, yes, for yes. I'm sorry, I thought you meant the players. Oh no, I didn't mean the players. No, I know, I know mm -hmm. that we had, what we had decided about the players because we had talked about that for a bit. My understanding was that the the spectators yes. have to follow the school policy. That's correct. Um, but there is no opt out option. There is no opt out. Okay, so my concern is how are we um, enforcing that? Because after watching a basketball game on Merrimack TV, it's clear that the adult spectators are doing an awesome job of abiding by our policy. However, when you see the, um, the camera pan to the student section, mm -hmm. they're almost entirely mask-free mm. multiple times. Okay. So it would probably be good if we can find some way to, you know, without being dramatic or whatever, but... You know, a stands full of, you know, say, I'm guessing, but by looking at them, approximately 100-ish, give or take, kids without masks on in the stands, panned over more than once. That was basic. There was almost no compliance in that section. Well, I'll, uh, I'll meet with the high school administration. We'll get the word out, and uh, we'll do several public service announcements. Yeah, also. I don't think we need to make it a big, you know, to do, but we do mm -hmm. need to, if we have a policy, we should have a, a, some way of enforcing it. Yes, I agree. You know, considering the rates in the community right now, we don't want to, what, what I guess my biggest concern is that we're going to have to say no more spectators. And I think that would be far worse than just enforcing the policy that's, that we have. That's correct. Um, I think it would be prudent to take the vote because we've historically done that month over month. So I would like a motion if someone would um, give me a motion. Shannon? I move to continue the practice of opt out with a requirement if a building reaches 5% or higher um, uh, for the month of January. Thank you. Do I have a second? Uh, made by Jenna. Any other discussion? All right, Jenna, how do you vote? In favor. Shannon? In favor. Lori? Favor. Lori Peters? I vote in favor. Lori Peters? In favor. 
Thank you. It's five uh, zero zero. And thank actually, you very much. point yeah, of order. I know. I know. I know. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, Lori, um, I just want to take a minute. We kind of got to rush mm -hmm. to the meeting, so forgive us, but we do have to do just uh, um, just a common thing to make sure that you can hear us contemporaneously. Can you hear us contemporaneously? Yes. Board, can you hear Lori contemporaneously? Yes. Um, and Lori, why is your um, presence um, not possible this evening? I suffered a knee injury that I have to stay off of. Okay. And where are you located? I'm in the office in my house. Is anybody with you? No. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. We'll continue with our agenda. All right, next is the approval of the capital improvement plan. And I think, I don't know, Matt, if you wanna lead that discussion. Sure. Yeah, when last we spoke, uh, when this was approved by the Planning and Building Committee and then it went in front of the school board, we basically had, uh, you know, it's a 10-year plan. Uh, we had our, our roofing program back online again. And uh, we had the, the paving of O'Gara Drive and the sidewalk going up O'Gara Drive is an item that we've been talking about for quite some time. And in talking with Steve Keach and talking with the Planning and Building Committee and with the expectation of the Town Center Committee that they would like to have a sidewalk going up O'Gara Drive to continue the loop around that they actually kind of completed with the sidewalk going down Woodbury Street. Remember the name of the street? I always forget that one. Uh, just recently that that would be something that uh, you would entertain. Uh, the other work that we had that was on the CIP that we got done by uh, via the uh, kindness and consideration of the trustees of trust funds was the bleachers and JMUs, the bleachers in the Smith Gym, and the floor and the JMUs APR. So we're looking at for this year, you know, 30,000 square feet of roofing at Thornton's Ferry Elementary School at $1.6 million, and uh, the paving of O'Gara, which is actually reclaiming the entire road and then reclaiming the entire sidewalk, bringing everything down a base gravel. It's not an overlay, it can't be. At this point in time, it's gone too far. So those are the two items that we have for your consideration. We have a map showing you the areas of roof, and we have a uh, letter from our roofing consultant. This isn't a company that sells roofing gear. This isn't a company that uh, is tied to any roofing company. It's strictly a, a consulting firm that uh, works in Bedford and Londonderry and a lot of school districts to walk the rooms with the roof, the rooms, the roofs with Tom Tussaud to make sure what Tom's seeing is what he thinks he's seeing. And so he concurred that this section really kind of has to be uh, replaced at uh, Thornton's Ferry Elementary School. And it's perhaps nothing that uh, we want to think about putting off for another year. We haven't done a roofing project in quite a few years. And uh, now the time is, uh, is, is near to take one on. Uh, obviously, this is not in the operating budget because it would have put it over default by around $1.8 million, and that would be untenable. We used to have roofy roofs in the operating budget years ago. The last one was the middle school uh, that we had in the operating budget. And uh, since that point in time, it's been taken out of the operating budget and the um, view of being transparent and giving people a choice whether or not they wanted to vote it you up or down and so this would be a consideration as far as the budget we presented for a warrant article perhaps um, obviously that's a board decision same thing with the uh, O'Gara Drive that would be a board decision also so not to vote on these as far as where the money is you're, all you're doing is voting on the plan. Whether or not it's funded or not, that's a conversation for another date. Shannon. Um, I do understand paving on O'Gara Drive has been pushed a number of times. Um, so with that, we're pretty much at a point where it's going to, I mean, it cannot be put off again, correct? 
I would say so, yes. Yep. And if you're going to do that, you have to do the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. which no, is I agree with that, yeah. 100%. I wouldn't want to do the sidewalk without doing the road because the road is such a condition that it is falling apart. That totally makes sense to me. And I just would have to say for kind of a, a point of reference, um, I would have wanted to see, I mean, we put warrant articles in not on whether the, what type of project it was, but what necessity the project was. So we always went through and we would say, Tom, tell us how serious this is. And he said, it could wait a year. Then we would put it on a warrant saying, we know we're going to do it. We know it has to be done. But if we wait a year, we probably are not running a high risk. I'm hearing high risk on this, very high risk, because we cannot have our roofs giving and having it raining inside our school buildings. That's not something we can ask the voters if it's okay for. So with this, I feel it has to be in the operating budget because again, we are putting our assets underneath that roof at risk. Um, and you're saying it's imminent from what I'm hearing. And so that has to be in an operating budget. It's the, you know, we need it, but we don't need it now. That's a Warren article. Um, we need it now. That's an operating budget. And so that's why the middle school was in the operating budget, because we need it now. It was going to rain inside. It was not up for discussion. This sounds not up for discussion in that same consistent manner. And I feel it needs to be in the operating budget now. Um, it's because we can't ask the voters if it's okay if it rains inside Thornton's Ferry. I don't think anyone can ask. Yeah, we can't push that off on the voters to make that kind of a critical decision. We have to make some tough choices here. Um, and that, to me, has to be there. Um, but that's why I'm asking about O'Gara, because if O'Gara could wait, I would say that is a Warren article. So if it's not going to, you know, cause any safety or harm to a student or a constituent, then it can wait but I don't think raining inside a building can wait. So, so those are the, just the feedback I wanted to have on that. And we are definitely gonna, in my, my estimation, having to put roofing into the budget. Well, as we're just beginning that process, um, I yep. think we'll have plenty of opportunity to do so. Yep. And then the other thing I have for this whole plan, and are we going year by year? Are we going? Because well, the, the other the thing I'm not seeing is a master plan SEU office study. And I think we need to have a plan. I don't think that can wait either. Um, that was unencumbered funds. That's already. Oh, we did the unencumbered. We so did unencumbered. TDA. So we have so, that. So we, we encumbered $40,000 for the stuff. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So, or so encumbered, that, that's not being... unencumbered. So basically what we want to do for this one, I think, is, is call it funded instead of TBA because it sounds like we're pushed. The way this is written, okay. it's kicking the can. Yeah. So, so call it funded. Yeah, because of COVID, everything got pushed that back. The fair. meetings that needed to happen didn't happen. Steve Keach has been in front of the um, uh, School District Planning and Building mm -hmm. Committee, had some preliminary discussions, passed some ideas, passed them. Uh, next, he's going to come up with a sketch. We'll go before them again, have a conversation, yeah. then come to the board, and then kind of roll it out to the public to yeah. see what happens. So that's going to be an ongoing oh, throughout sure. the year process. Sure, sure. No, yeah. but I just think that it says you want to change like the we language. don't have a plan to fund it. And I yeah. think we just want to put in this for 22, 23 funded through encumbered funds. Yeah. And then take out the TBDs throughout the rest of it because it's going to happen this year because the funding is in this year, but through an act of the board last year. Yes, because this Correct. says study. It doesn't say the consequence Correct. of what we're going to be doing. The building should be TBD. Yes. I agree with you there. Thank you. The campus, I should say. Yeah. Right. Anything else, Shannon? Um, those were my critical for this year, but how are we, are we going through year three by year? Or is this just trying to go through everything? Cause I have a couple other notes. <laughs> um, so the Merrimack high school bond is paid off, um, as of the fiscal year, 24, 25 middle and, school. Yeah. A uh, middle school. Sorry. I put, yeah. did I put MHS? Okay. No, I did put MHS. So MMS. Um, so with that, I think, you know, that one document that you always gave to us, we haven't gotten this year shows the bonded debt with the CIP to show where a natural, um, drop off of our operating budget will happen because of a payoff of a bond. So with 24, 25, and I look at all these numbers and how we look at some of those CIP projects, how do we stabilize the tax rate knowing that those bonded amounts are going to fall off? Cause this only is one 
And, and again, we're going to be dropping off 24, 25 by roughly 800,000, not having the payment yeah, schedule correct. in front of me. So I'm looking at what we're doing, trying to spread it out. How could we stabilize some of this? So that way we would take that 800,000 into account and not have such dips and spikes. Um, Cause again, I, th I think we would look to maybe take some of those things, move them up. Cause I think again, when we lighten up that debt load and we get those projects handled, it's gonna help us to do those critical things that that master plan SEU office study are going to, you know, we want to present. So I think right now, if we don't holistically look at this, I think we're not going to be doing the service of the vision of funding and how, again, to get all those big projects done and not create a dip and a spike in the tax rate. So I'm not seeing that here. And that, that does have me a little concerned. Yeah, you're not you're not seeing because you know in twenty four twenty five there's going to be sub eight hundred thousand dollars worth of debt that we're going to shed. Right. So you really, know, a couple of years ago we had the high school edition that was done, and I had the mm -hmm. the two thousand edition that was six million dollars that mm -hmm. we took a twenty year bond out. You know that was finally done. Mm -hmm. You know so that was done a few years ago, and that shed like maybe four hundred thousand dollars worth of debt, which we in turn replaced with the ventilation four hundred thousand dollar debt payment. So that was kind of a one for one. Um, there's nothing in here that supplements or takes the place of that $750,000 that we're going to be losing or $800,000 mm -hmm. unless you look at the roof in 24, 25 and say, aha, that's it. But that has to be done anyway. So maybe there's something else in here you would like to, to move in as far as a infrastructure project for the master plan study or something to look at. I'm not sure. Well, that's, that's why I think we want to look at because, you know, we are supposed to like we went through it, we're reviewing it and, you know, finalizing it, but in the same token, we don't have the, the big picture of what the impact of the tax rate is with the way we're, we're approaching it this year. And with that, I think that if you take some of these projects and kind of move them, 24, 25 is, is gonna have a lightening of the load just because that's when we're gonna have 800,000 less. Do we take some of those 25, 26, 26, 27, and move them down. And that's going to create a pocket where you can start to think about bonding a new building. Do you, um, would you recommend that we table this till our next meeting? I, you I can think see? that there's some workshopping we should be doing yeah, on this. That's but, fine. but in the same token, I, I just, I saw some of the stuff now with the budget book, it creates a bigger picture of what we're trying to accomplish. I think that, and again, if we could get that document with bonded debt built into it, we can show what the true dips and spikes are that infrastructure create for, for our tax rate. Yep, I I have that document. Uh, I you know did it's my it. favorite, I did it, Matthew. I know I did it around 18 years ago, uh, just for my own, <laughs> just for my own edification, and then I think Ken Coleman saw it and mm -hmm. says, "I want that," and yeah. so it became very popular. It, it, so let me do a redo. Okay. Feather all this stuff in there, and then we'll pass it out, and we'll do this again. You know, th this is, you know, for your review, if you want sure. to approve the whole thing or just, you know, look at it to understand, to help you in budgeting. But I'd be happy to give you that document. We'll, we'll document, and we'll give it another go-round. I would love be to awesome. do a true workshop on this, because I think when you talk about 10 years of infrastructure and the amount, the ticket items at $1.6 million, $1.2 million, that impacts a tax rate every time you touch it. So we want to make sure we're doing it in a way that gets the business done and then gives us a chance to do the things that need to get done that aren't being done, like the SAU SPED building, like the redesign of the campus that will integrate the SAU SPED building in, like the elimination of those three buildings that are not sustainable for long-term um, instruction and administration. So those are the things I'm looking, I'm looking at to, to try to kind of clean it up and move it forward now that we're coming out, coming out of a pandemic. Uh, and I use that term very loosely, but now that we're starting to get into a no more normal operating operating environment, it had to be tabled the last two years. So board member Rothhouse had a couple of um, comments. So um, first of all, Matt, I think um, you take really good care of our facilities and it's greatly appreciated. Um, I said this at the last meeting, I would encourage the board to write a Warren article so we could take surplus funds and put it back into our capital improvement plan. And then under the master plan, I think the Brentwood building is there, but I, 
you know, a comment that I would like to see is maybe have the Brentwood building on its own line because it's a, it's a concern that we talk about and it's something that we're gonna have to take care of in the future. Matt, any thoughts? No, I think that's something you definitely have to address. It's uh, been sitting there for a while. Uses a training site for the Merrimack Police Department. Well, that's of good use, but that's not of optimal use. And one of, well, I know one of the recommendations in talking with Steve and talking with Planning and Building Committee is the, the Brentwood building needs to be uh, not there anymore. And any concerns with um, deferring the capital improvement? No. Um, we're not in no. any timeline crunch or anything? We don't have a timeline to go in front of the Town of Merrimack Planning Board. I haven't heard of anything like that. So. Okay. Everyone know, okay with that take, here? Take, yeah, All right. take your time. Thank you. Well, let's do that and let's um, look at it in that um, format that you agreed to provide and we'll pick yep. that up at the next agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we will move on to the new business, which is the formal presentation on the food service budget. Dave, welcome. I haven't seen you in a while. So. <laughs> Hopefully you're doing well. Okay, all right. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, I would like to present the budget for the Food Service Department for 2022 and 2023. Um, first of all, I would like to say last year was uh, a very unusual year. As you can see with some of the expended amounts, they were not anywhere near what we had budgeted for, um, only because of the, the hybrid um, that we had in place and had half the students in the building and it was a little bit different um, as far as um, planning and budgeting for that for that year um, for this year um, for 2022 2023 um, we'd like to keep it as level funded as we could um, some of the questions I think uh, Shannon had I can read the question off and put my glasses on. All right, so a question from Shannon. With costs, cost of goods being impacted by inflation, has there been any consideration to adjust for the cost of supplies to address the potential increase in costs? Um, and the response we have is there's no inflation factor in the food service. Uh, the expenditures are covered by uh, an appropriate amount of funding and it's self-supported. It's, and it's hard to say what we're going to be looking at um, next year with the supply chain. I know this year we've had a, a, a number of items that were either not available um, in the paper supplies. Um, some of them have been substituted. Some of them still aren't available. So I'm hoping that with another year under our belt, the things will start to loosen up some of the shipping problems we have out in the west coast will loosen up and we'll be able to get some of those products back um so i think i'm going to stick with what we have for funding there um hopefully what we have for income coming in will cover some of the costs that we incurred um the second question you had was would the federal support for lunch programs uh, without having the same reporting requirements that were in place in pre-pandemic are there plans in place to account for what may be a risk in funding if we do not get the applications in place for future years? Um, and I think currently we have free meals for all students, so it's it's a great it's a great um, thing that we're doing right now. The government gave us that option um, to do it with seamless summer option, and um, we've got a great response with the students coming in and getting the food every day. Um, We've had an unprecedented amount of, of student, student participation. And the uh, government has also given us higher reimbursement rates for the, for the meals that we're, we're shipping out every day. Um, as far as free and reduced applications, we do encourage uh, parents to still fill those out. Um, we, we haven't had the response that we normally get, but we also say that if they do fill them out, they will carry over for the next school year for the first month so um, that's a bonus and there's other other bonuses as long uh, along with that too um, as far as the funding for title one i 
I'm not sure exactly. I know they were um, allowing um, previous year numbers to be used, 1819, I believe, last year. So I'm not sure if that's still in, in play for Title I funding, but I can, I can find that out for you. And as far as um, the rate increase for meals, um, we do have a paid lunch equity um, formula that we use to determine that, and that's based on what the federal reimbursement rate is. So um, looking forward, we'll probably do that again next year. Yeah, uh, my question was really, because I saw your answer, mm -hmm. uh, really around the fact that I think that they don't adjust for inflation, adjust for like what you would consider the, the poverty level. Mm -hmm. You know, that it seems to be a, a number that no one, no family could ever live on makes you eligible. And I think that's what's always been a concern. Um, I'm hearing a lot of red flags, like from what you're saying, that we're getting an increased usage of the lunch program. And we were hearing over the last couple of years that you were seeing a decrease in the usage. Now, again, I know that we are a prideful community. Um, mm -hmm. And that just tells me that there might be concerns that we do have people who um, don't aren't getting those meals because they didn't have the funds and didn't want to expose that they didn't have the funds and did not take the meals. Mm -hmm. So I have a you know it, it's it's giving a couple of red flags. I don't know how you know again we're not going to solve them in a budget hearing, but it, it, I think it's those are data points that you shared tonight that have me my eyes wide open. Mm -hmm. You know because we did. I think you've come to us. And we had to raise the rates because usage is down, but now I'm saying well if usage is up because there's no funding required no fee required from the student that mm -hmm. maybe the the issue may be bigger than we know okay so this is like mm -hmm. I, I i don't know how, it's something that we would not necessarily vet down to the granular level at this table but that that's got my eyes wide open to, to a, what might be a bigger issue in our community as far as um, food insecurity mm -hmm. so that was that was interesting to learn but no for <clears> me it's i know your calculations are based on what they call the the poverty rate Correct. And my understanding is the federal government doesn't change that income benchmark. So as people are getting raises, which are probably not even commensurate with the rate of inflation, it could make them ineligible. And now we could get that gap back again. Mm -hmm. So those are things I'm wondering if you could give us updates on what those federal salary requirements are and ha when was the last time maybe they changed to see if it's changing with the rate of inflation. Because, I mean, honestly, you know, McDonald's is paying fifteen dollars an hour Correct. so but yeah. the thing is they're they're not getting you know so i just worry that it's, just we're just just that. for reference shannon for a family of eight i just because i looked at it recently oh, yeah? mm -hmm. for a family of eight you have to make less than eighty six thousand dollars a year for for the waltons you have to make mm -hmm. less than eighty six thousand so and it goes down from there yeah. so and, and and they do adjust that yearly, mm -hmm. but yeah. it's not a lot. So. It's right. not a lot. No. But, but the rent in Merrimack is what two thousand. Two thousand mm -hmm. bucks a month. So, so. yeah, you know, eyes wide open. <clears throat> so thank you. Your data actually opens up a lot more questions yep. than than uh, yep. than just food. Honestly, it always does. So I appreciate that. <clears throat> thank you. Um, and I, I just want to say, you know, it's been a great response with the with the students. Um, Students have been very, uh, uh, we've had bigger lines, of course, and um, the students have been very cooperative with that. Um, we have had some sa staffing issues trying to get uh, positions filled, and it's been, a, it's been a little trying this year, but um, everybody's pitching in and trying to do their best, and um, we're hoping the students will be uh, thankful for that as well. I appreciate your hard work, all of your staff, so thank you. Oh, thank you. Any other questions for Dave? Any comments? I have a quick question, Cinda. Yeah, sure. Lori, go ahead. Um, this was actually just a conversation that came up this weekend, and so I was looking at the budget. The um, food service, food and milk line item that is going up, is that to bring back all cart items for students to purchase? Um, let me hear that question one more time. I'm looking at the food service, food and milk line yep. um, that's, that's increasing and it says it's for a la carte and class A lunches. Is that the standard lunch or is that for students to purchase a la carte items in addition to or instead of the standard lunch menu? 
Well, I think it's, um, it's, it is level funded at 600,000 and it does include a la carte oh, and yeah. regular meals. Um, and we've, you know, that purchase is, is for everything um, from milk to, to the main line items um, and any a la carte that we do purchase for students to buy. And we are, okay. we- I just had heard a number of parents who would like to see the a la carte off menu items come back. Yes, um, well, we, we have that um, available at um, the high school, middle school, and, and the upper elementary right now. Um, so they are, they are, we are getting back, um, maybe slowly, but we're getting back to that. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Senator, may I ask a question? Of course. Dave, um, you know, we've always, we've talked in the last several months about supply chain issues for various uh, goods and services. Are government commodities, uh, have government commodities been subject to the su su supply Absol chain interruptions? Absolutely, I, I appreciate that question because um, that's one of the hardships that we've had is, mm. is when, when I do it, when I project what I need for the coming year, um, I do that in February for the next year, for the whole school year. So I have to make projections for ground beef and beef patties and chicken and stuff like that for a whole year. Um, so it happened just prior to the pandemic. And um, some of the items that we would normally get aren't showing up this year. So that makes it a little more difficult um, with, with what we have to look at for purchasing because then we have to, then we have to buy some of these items that aren't showing up. Um, one of the, one of the Great things is that some of the com the commodity dollars that I can use is for fresh fruit and vegetables, so um, I was able to set aside fifty five thousand dollars in in funds for fresh fruit and vegetables this year, yeah. um, which we're using quite a quite a bit of. So that's that's the great part, and I can order that every week. Um, as far as the USDA uh, commodity foods, it comes once a month, and um, I do get updates saying that this item might be cut or the, the numbers that I asked for has been reduced so they can spread it out amongst the state. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely is, a, is a, an issue um, as far as commodity foods go. Yeah. Yeah. Thank it's you. one of the economic lifelines of uh, viability of a food Absolutely, program. yeah, absolutely. Any other questions or comments? Shannon. Um, if we're gonna ask questions that weren't prepped, can we just get from the board member asking the page number in the in the book section we're in and the account number so we can reference back as well as we're going through. I think that's a fair ask. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Thank you. I Have a good night. It. Have Thank a you. nice holiday. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Dave gets here at five o'clock in the morning, so I think he's going home to go to sleep right now. And not watch any basketball. Not watch, yeah, that's right. And then the next up is the formal presentation on Master Cola Upper Elementary School Budget. And Marsha McGill. There it is, excuse me. So the upper elementary school budget for 2022 and 2023 continues to reflect the priorities established by the Merrimack School District and the Merrimack School Board. We continue to invest in all academic disciplines, the arts, social and emotional learning. Factors significant to this year's budget include the new co-curricular lines provided interested student opportunities or to participate in educator-led after-school enrichment opportunities, the purchase of sound equipment for recording band and chorus performances, 
the replacement of an alto sax for the JMU's band, uh, the purchase of text and instructional resources for a vari variety of reading levels to support literacy instruction for grades five and six students, and also includes resources and materials for writing across the curriculum. Also, the replacement of cafeteria tables, we're continuing with that. Um, this will be the seventh phase of 12 for purchasing the replacement tables. We're getting there, okay? And also the replacement of science room stools for chairs. We continue with that. With that, I'd like to start with some of the questions that were given to us by the board that would have come to our school as well as some of the other elementary schools. I'll read the question and then I'll read the response. The first area was in reference to supplies science supplies, the question from uh, Chair Guayumi and Vice Chair Rothhaus. The first question is, this seems like a lot of money for glassware, thermometers, and stopwatches. What else does this account cover, or how many items are we budgeting for? The second question in reference to this is science supplies. Can you please provide a further breakdown of this fund? Also, while on the topic, we recall that many line items in the elementary budget used to also provide an account for students and per student costs. Is there a reason we're not doing that this year? So our elementary science curriculum is taught with consumable materials through kits. These are hands-on activities with various supplies that need to be replenished annually. Because there's a variability of cost, the per student cost is really not relevant. Supplies needed for grade levels varies depending on the grade level. We had another question in reference to health supplies, and it would be again from uh, Chair Guayumi and Vice Chair Rothhaus. Is this enough money to cover supplies for the entire school? This is health, guys. It seems like a very low amount given the number of students. This was to one of the schools. This is level funded from last year. The amount is proportionately accurate based on enrollment numbers. We then had a question in reference to community relations. This also came from Chair Guayumi and Vice Chair Rothhaus. Please describe how this money is used to support home, school, and community collaboration. This, su excuse me, this account supports home, school, and community collaboration Examples include the online new newsletter subscription, volunteer orientations and celebrations, the annual hawk walk, and volunteer lunch on field day. Those are some of the examples of what we support with community relations. We then had several questions in reference to the co-curricular line, which is a new line. Again, we had three questions that came from Vice Chair uh, Guayumi and Vice Chair Rothhaus, and then one from Board Member Barnes. The first question is, similar um, to elementary schools, what does this involve? Is it a stipend? While on the subject, please provide the board with any stipend amounts paid at JMU's. The next question was, please provide the breakdown of supplies needed at all schools. Then. Please provide a description of what it will be used for exactly. Is it a stipend? Does it enhance work we are doing with the Adult Learning Center in after school care? Please advise regarding this breakdown at all schools. And then uh, Board Member Barnes asks, please provide proposed extracurricular programs so that we can understand the level and inclusivity to the student body these funds will support. Please also provide details on timing these programs Will they impact the after-school care and transportation for families? To frame the concern, wanting to be sure extracurricular are not just available to those who have parents who can pick kids up an hour after school ends or as part of the online after-school programs. Also, will there be costs to families for any of these programs? If yes, are there accommodations for those who cannot participate due to financial constraints? This is a new account for all elementary schools. The intent of this program is to offer a variety of diverse opportunities for all students. The goal is to provide educator-led activities after school based on student interests. We will consider the needs of families when scheduling and planning the opportunities. 
there will be no cost to families for participation. There are currently no stipends for co-curricular activities in any of our elementary budgets. At JMU, some of the offerings may include the, Jaguar, uh, the Jogging Jaguar running program, field hockey, volleyball, academic assistance, an art club, and a chess and cribbage club for just a few examples. Programs at the pre-K through four schools may include, but are not limited to, Girls on the Run, Healthy Kids Running Club for Boys, Gardening, Coding, Theater, Legos, or other creative endeavors. The National Adult Learning Center is an after-school care program and not tethered to the proposed co-curricular activities. Students who participate in this after-school care program can participate in the co-curricular activities and then go to the Adult Learning Center after the activity's over. Uh, Marcia, that was my question and you kind of didn't answer it. Um, and that is, you know, if they're in the National Adult Learning Center, they're in the building. But it's basically saying that if you are, if you have a stay-at-home mom or you're in the National program, you can participate. But if you have working parents and you say you go to YMCA, I think Lisa's Tippy Toes, I mean, there's a, a number of different ones. Um, Apple Blossoms, I'm, I could probably, I'm old, so I don't rattle them off as quickly anymore. Um, but how are they going to do that? Again, is it now just a select group of kids that will be able to, to take advantage of these programs when those may not be the kids that need them the most? Mm -hmm. Well, we might have some programs, for example, that might be scheduled in the morning so that when kids get dropped off, they might be able to. Um, not knowing what those programs are, because we're going to look towards the interest of the students, we'd probably look to say, when's the best time for us to offer this? Mm -hmm. Maybe some of them could even maybe be structured around the recess time might be a possibility. So there, there could be some different options like that that could be offered to students. But we don't have an after-school bus. Right, no you don't, and that's, that's kind of the point. How can we do it where if there's working families, are there gonna be flexible things that maybe some of them might be offered after their parents pick them up from daycare and then they can go back and do an after-school activity. Mm -hmm. And I'm just worried that everything happens five minutes after the buses leave the yard. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to take a lot of kids that get after school care off campus, um, but are, are contracted out because parents are working to not be able to participate in these programs. And, uh, but we're funding for all. And it's just, I can see where it's only going to be available to some. Mm -hmm. and, and it may not be the ones that need it the most. So that, that's, that's my only caution on this that, you know, as you're designing these programs and as we're funding them, that we do it the way that all kids could take advantage of it. And, and you know, I don't say that there's a perfect, perfect formula for that, but I think, you know, five minutes after the buses leave the yard is probably not the ideal for that reason. Th th that's a concern I have that we're funding all this and only a few kids can get it. Mm -hmm. I have a question, uh, Lori. So um, my only thing is I'm hoping after um, you have some time to put this together, we will have more details on you know, what the programs are going to look like, what the dates are, um, and, and I know you're all going to do it based on student, you know, uh, participation, but, you know, just to have that. And then, you know, what is the breakdown are, you know, is there going to be a $500 stipend per, per or, you know, it's, it's, we, there's not a lot of money there, so mm -hmm. how does that going to really look? Mm -hmm. I know at the upper elementary we had talked about the possibility of maybe we would run the programs were a 12 week program so it would run like a trimester and we do some activities in the fall some in the spring and then some through the winter so that there would be a variety that's offered you know all the time and depending on the interest of students and really what they'd like to have we would then determine when that would fall in the year and then maybe what that stipend would be and if it takes one person to run that. I know that in the past we've run our Jogging Jaguar program and we've had upwards of 80 students per session. Per session. We have an art club going on right now with 30 students and you know, we had field hockey in the fall with about 35 students. So you know, it just depends on the, the interest and in, in what's there. But we had thought about running something a good amount of time and then have different offers throughout the year. Michelle, you might have some ideas in that question. 
fun. I was going to say, too, if, if you're comfortable, you can always feel free to take down your mask while you're speaking. Okay. You don't have to. If you're not comfortable, that's fine, but it is an option. Thank you. And if you can't hear me, certainly let me know, and I will, I'm happy to do that. Um, this One of the um, things that started this was we've had a number of parents at the elementary level, um, particularly families who have moved in that have asked for activities and opportunities after school. And so currently we have a few things that are run sometimes by parent volunteers, maybe girls on the run if we are able to have a parent or a coach. So this was our beginning attempt to offer some of those things. We also talked at the elementary school level about shorter sessions that would be based on what teachers were interested in or had, it, had um, an expertise in as well as the things that students were interested in and perhaps they would be four weeks, six weeks shorter after school once or twice a week so they could really concentrate on something. Then we could serve a, uh, service a variety of students over the time. So our proposal came from looking at stipends for educators and what that would be per hour. Um, if we could run so many sessions per year and then what, what would we um, imagine would be the cost. But again, this was in, you know, in our beginning stages in trying to provide opportunities to students after school um, based on their need as well as teacher interest, um, both socially, academically, um, and things that are just fun for kids. Thank you. The question was also in reference about what would the breakdown of supplies be? And again, depend determined on the basis of the student interest and what activities would be offered then those activity offerings would determine what those supply amounts would be. And until we determine those, we wouldn't know that exactly. Another area that we had questions in was the area of traffic from um, Chair Guayumi and Vice Chair Rothhouse. Please explain these funds. Is it paid to the Merrimack Police Department? Um, is this a placeholder or do we actually use it? We assume that there were no funds expended last year due to COVID. That is correct. This is to pay for police detail and traffic control when large activities occur at school. Events might include things like the parent nights, our art shows, or art festivals in the spring, family fun night and activities like that. Field trips. Is this all-inclusive for field trips or do families have to contribute? The money we have on our accounts is for transportation expenses and parent chaperone admission fees. Families pay for students admission. Accommodations are provided always for those students who cannot pay. Additional equipment for music. This is something to the upper elementary school from uh, Chairperson Guayumi and Vice Chair Rothhouse. Please describe the need for the sound equipment for recording grades five and six. Jane Hughes is seeking recording equipment in order to record student performances and shows such as band, chorus, and recital nights. The recordings will be placed on the websites for parents who cannot attend and to support community <coughs> involvement. Currently, we have um, equipment that projects sound out while the performance is going on, but we have nothing to record it, so we rely on community members to record, or kind enough, Merrimack TV has recorded some of ours, but we wanna just make sure we have those recorded and we put those on the website, so we thought we would ask for that equipment. Furniture, we have a question. Um, Board Member Barnes says, why is there a reduction in furniture replacement in the upcoming fiscal year? We have seen consistent funding to keep furniture in a stable replacement cycle. Is the it is down by roughly one third year over year. And at the upper elementary school, if you remember, we've replaced the last couple years, all our tables in our computer labs. That purchase has been completed, so we didn't need to have that cost of those computer tables in our budget, so we just took that out of there, but kept our cafeteria tables and our science chairs. The next area is technology, and the question is from Chair Gauyumi and Vice Chair Rothhouse. 
clarifying question, what are the supplies for computer education? Paper and toner? If so, anything else? This is in reference to all schools, and I'm going to turn this over to uh, Assistant Superintendent Chevenel. <coughs> yeah, the computer ed supplies is, uh, you know, toner, cartridges, keyboards, power supplies, mice. They have a tendency to disappear, break, or power cords. All the stuff that uh, all our computer technicians need to facilitate repairs. Now, this, these have been purchased centrally by the library technology department and then apportioned out to the schools as needed for uh, repairs. RAM also for computers to upgrade. I know mine's been upgraded just recently with some RAM. And so it's all the, the stuff that we need in, in the workshop to keep the repair technicians uh, repairing computers to keep them in service. So that's what that is about. Thank you. Okay. We also had a question about copy, copiers. Uh, when do we decide to replace versus fix a copier or rent copiers? How old are our machines and what's the life expectancy? Assistant Superintendent Chevenel. Oh, thank you. I was like the copier guru years ago, and then Nancy Rose came came along, and she she kind of improved on the situation and put us into a managed service kind of contract, which is really cool. But uh, and I, I agree with her; it's it's worked out well. But just to give you an idea, we have around 48 copiers in the district. This is not printers or anything like that. We did a purge years ago, much of much gnashing of teeth and anxiety of inkjet printers in this district. We extracted them during the summertime under the cover of darkness <laughs> so no one would know. And then we replaced them with, with color laser jets that were much more cost effective because the inkjets were like 25 cents a click, you know, and the other ones were like 10 cents a click. By the click, I mean copy. That's copier jargon for those of you who are not familiar with that. So anyway, we have 48 copies, copiers. They currently have a total of 45 million copies on them sitting right now. Of those 48 copiers, we're going to be looking at this year replacing 21 of them. Uh, two at MES, two at the middle school, two at the high school, uh, let's see, no, one, two, three, four at the high school, so sad. two at Reed's, one at JMU's, and two at Thornton's Ferry. The high school has the largest, we're not discussing high school, but what the heck, I'm talking about copiers, so you have to kind of look at it holistically. You know, they have three million, four million copies, another one has four million copies. When they get to the three to four million copy range, and these are your Xerox D95 workhorse kind of machines, they have a tendency to um, not function as well as they do, and I don't know about you, but when I go to the copy machine, I'd like it to work. If not, I try my own repair scenario, which is not, you know, well, you know, not approved of, you know, but anyway, so we have these 21 are going to be replaced. Um, that's when we look at it. So it's usually like a five year cycle. You know, those heavy use machines after five years, they've got like three, three to four million on them, and it's time for them to go. You never want to purchase a copier because then at the end of its life cycle, you own a piece of hazardous, hazardous waste that you have to get rid of. So you want to do the lease plan, which we've done ever since. Make it around a five-year lease. When it gets to the end of the lease, go ahead and do a refresh, get new machines in. Everybody's happy. They work again. And the cost per copy for maintenance actually for service and supplies actually goes down. So you have a capital cost which comes in and then you have a cost per copy for service and supplies which goes down. So you almost can keep kind of the same amount budgeted over the years by refreshing these copiers, which has been the case, which has been fairly stable over the, over the years. We, we've kept it the same. We used to pay like maybe 
eight cents a, a copy, we're down to like four cents a copy now with some of these machines. And when you're talking a million copies a year, you know, with some of these machines, well, that that's adds up to money. So that's the history and the story of, of copiers and managed print services. Cinda, I have questions on that specific, if you don't yes. mind. Go ahead. Okay, um, so a couple things. You said 21 to 48 are getting replaced this year. This current year we're in or the upcoming fiscal year? They're going to be replaced now. Current fiscal year, okay. And yeah. just when you said that you fix things the way they don't, I'm picturing you with like the fonts with the jukebox trying to fix the <laughs> I just wanted to let you know that. I, wasn't, I, I, I that. shouldn't have said that little <laughs> comment, but yeah, that has happened. The fonts with the jukebox. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the jukebox turns on on the show, just not in, with your copyright, I guess. No. Um, no, no and, and the other thing I think, you know, because I actually do have a little experience in this from my career, and, and that is, you're talking about Xerox. They actually have apps, and I know that Heather will be coming. And there are some devices that have apps that are true copiers. And they have apps such as translation. So you scan something in English, it can come out in Mandarin. So, or Spanish, or there's like probably 50 different languages that can do. I've watched it done um, when I was at a Xerox event. But those are things that might help with, and again, it's not about making a copy, it's about making an asset that you need that will help students. So, so as you're going into these these um, these areas of, of uh, research, that's something you may want to consider. What can it do besides copy? And and different providers have different apps that can do different things. But you're right, MPS devices and services, absolutely the way to control costs in such a volatile space as, as yeah. a copier in a, in a school district. So yeah. In fact, you know, we're gonna have we're gonna have a conversation pretty soon. And I'm sure I'll, I'll get information on, I'll ask about those enhanced yeah. services. I mean, yep. for, for, first, you know, when we first started, you know, copiers were just to make paper copies. Mm -hmm. And then we found out that you could actually scan a document and have it sent to your email address and save it as a PDF on your computer. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was like a godsend. It was like a miracle, you know. So I don't have any paper. I don't have anything yeah. like that. It's all scanned and it's it's on my computer or on my hard drive. So there there's been so much advancement. And the next memo I write, Bill, I'm gonna have it translated into Mandarin for that. him. Yeah. <laughs> there's an app for that. There's there is an app, for that. an app for that. So mm -hmm. thank you. It would be so easy. It would be so easy. The next question we have is in reference to textbooks from uh, Chairperson Vayumi and Vice Chair Rothhouse. Uh, two questions here. Please describe the textbook rotation process. How do we align the textbooks to the curriculum? And do students take textbooks home or are they classroom sets? Please describe if they are consumables, particularly interested in the approximate $17,000 and how it aligns to the district reading program. I'm going to turn this over to Assistant Superintendent Yarlot. Thank you, Marcia. Um, in regard to the first part of the question uh, about the textbook rotation process, that pretty much happens during um, a curriculum revision process. And a perfect example of that is the recent revision of the math curriculum. And so that we started with the math curriculum and then we decided the appropriate textbook that most best aligned to the curriculum. And in that case, it was the Envisions program and uh, big ideas for the middle school and the high school. So the curriculum drove the, the choice and selection of the textbooks. And that would happen with as we revise any of the curriculum. Um, and that um, the um, contract that we have with, is, with Envisions is a six year contract, so that we'll be looking at a bump two years down the road in terms of looking at uh, curriculum selection, um, textbook selection. Um, so at, students have the option of taking textbooks home as needed. Generally, they're housed in the classrooms, we have um, multiple sets of various uh, levelized readers in all of the pre-K, K through six classrooms that are used for the guiding reading process. We also have um, a whole plethora of consumables that need to be uh, replenished every year. Those include their writing journals, the making meaning journals, the f um, literacy footprints, um, the Envision textbooks, uh, work workbooks for the students. Um, we also have the A to Z online readers. 
Um, and then whenever an additional classroom is added to a grade level, there are situations where we might need to purchase a whole kit um, to, for that classroom teacher. So it might be a whole literacy footprints kit or a whole envisions kit, depending on the enrollment numbers in that particular year. Questions? Okay. There are a couple more questions to be addressed by the pre-K through fourth grade schools. Thank you. And so thank you for allowing Marsha and I to present together to share the questions that were common to all of the schools. Um, at this point, I will answer the questions that were related just to the lower elementary schools. Before I do that, I would like to introduce the other administrators that are here with me. Um, I have Alicia hansen Pru, who is the assistant principal at Master Cola, Thornton's Ferry principal, Julie DeLuca, and assistant principal, Michaela Champlin, and then principal of Reed's Ferry School, Bonnie Panchode, and assistant principal, Laura Libby. So the three elementary schools collaborated with each other as well as with the upper L to propose fiscally responsible budgets that meet the rigorous expectations we hold for our students. There are a few questions from the board that pertain to only the lower elementary schools, so I will answer those on behalf of the three schools, MES, TFS, and RFS. So our first questions are about furniture and they came from Chairperson Guayumi and Vice Chair Rothhouse, as well as a question from board member Barnes. Um, do we need ADA furniture for other schools right now? What $1,000 in furniture is needed for extra classrooms as it doesn't seem like very much money for an entire classroom? Are there any other furniture needs at the other two schools? We understand past practice and the need to keep from budget spikes, but we'd like to know if there are any immediate needs that are on hold until it's another school's turn. Um, and the other part of the question from um, Board Member Barnes, it was noted that TFS furniture funds were transferred to MES and RFS for the purpose of purchasing ADA furniture. Please provide if other impacts to your furniture replacement plan occurred due to this shift in funding. So thank you for, I'm gonna take my mask off because my glasses are fogging up. <laughs> so past budgets have typically replaced furniture for one to two classrooms each year. This budget does the same. However, the type of furniture we are buying is specifically to the meet the needs of diverse learners at each of the three schools. The proposed furniture budget at MES also includes new furniture for the art room. This completes the purchasing for art rooms at all three of the schools. In response to the question about what was cut in the furniture budget at TFS, there is in reality not a cut, but a rebalancing of funding. In the past two budgets, TFS has included furniture to outfit brand new classrooms. They are, there are not any new classrooms being added this year, only shifts in grade levels. This is addressed by the $1,000 request at each school. Therefore, in the attempt to be res fiscally responsible, we have proposed moving these funds to the other two buildings. As we move forward in other years, there will continue to be furniture needs as a result of meeting the diverse needs of learners and further implementation of universal design for learning. Should we not receive the funding we are requesting, we will continue to use what we have, being mindful um, that it does not adequately meet the needs of all of our learners, as well as the increasing cost of furniture. Go ahead. You answered it, but you didn't. And, and I'll get into that. I'm going to throw Matt in for fun, because he's, he's fun to throw in. Um, and I know that we're seeing that we've traditionally used this as furniture replacement. And I think what you have asked for is absolutely warranted, appropriate, and encouraged and celebrated that we're going to have integrated ADA. And I think it really plays into, not plays in, it, it like marries well everything you're doing with UDL and creating environments for individual learners. And I think that we want to make sure that the old stuff is not being um, dragged out, I guess, you know, where you're going to have to do three classrooms because we did ADA. So the question to Matt is, is there a way of taking the furniture line and having new furniture and then like in incremental furniture versus replacement? So that way we can see where the cycling is happening and we know where, based on the goals we have with UDL, that we're integrating new 
um, new furniture and new um, new structures that will help um, to kind of create the classroom of the future. So we know what we're investing in for the future and what we need to keep stable for the for the you know for the regular. Um, nor I, I hate to say normal because normal is a terrible word, uh, but for the for the traditional learning environment. Yeah, so, so that that obviously that that can absolutely be be called mm -hmm. out and, and separated. Yeah. So so new new furniture that that's more um, approachable from an ADA standpoint, mm -hmm. but which is probably better for all kids. Mm -hmm. I know in talking with Heather Barker, if there's anything that's specifically needed for a student to meet the ADA requirements, she purchases it out of her budget because that's the appropriate place for it okay. it's like the adaptive assistive equipment line sure but something like that in the schools mm -hmm. ab ab absolutely yeah so you don't see you it's, you're not thinking of a, a combo desk or a desk and a chair replacement this right. is newer versions of what we used to buy and and i have to say i'm just assuming but some, i don't seating. think it's going to make an ass out of you nor me to say that sometimes yes. when you get those adaptable um, the furniture, it's not going to cost the same as the chair. So again, you know, you're not going to get as much for that dollar, but you, what that dollar does can be quantified and, and culled so that way we can actually budget more appropriately as we're getting more individual learning needs presented to us because it sounds like that's happening every day. And so with that, we want to make sure that we are budgeting appropriately to the needs of the child under UDL. But again, it's not necessarily going to be a Heather Barker thing. It's going to be this child is, does better in a wiggle chair, but this child doesn't necessarily have a medical need for a wiggle chair. Those kind of things. You know what I'm saying? So whatever mm -hmm. we can do to help, I think, identify that and, and help to model our budgets accordingly, I think calling it out might be helpful for what you're trying to do in your classrooms to get those learners optimized. Yeah. I agree with you 100%, Shannon, and I think, you know, aside from the needs that are clearly defined, teachers know these kids, you know, and they, I can give an example back to my oldest son when he was in second grade, um, and I'll call out Mrs. Her on that because she had phenomenal, um, um, she just had instincts, you know, the way that she worked with my child was amazing, and she, you know, knew that he needed, my son needed a place. I don't bring out my kids very often in this context, but I think it's, you know, relevant. And, you know, she knew automatically that he needed a place. He liked, you had a messy desk, and he needed a clean place to work. And she had a place that he could bounce back and forth to. And she just, and that made him a more successful learner. And so, you know, and, you know, he was not in an IEP at that time. I recall, and um, and I think just I think it just speaks to teachers knowing the kids, and it could be a different need for a different kid depending on the day. You have a kid having a bad day, and no one knows that, um, but the teacher in that class. So I think Shannon's point is right on um, that giving flexibility, you know, in our classrooms um, for needs whether or not they're on an IEP or a 504, what did we always say, right? What's good for kids on 504s and IEPs are often good for typical kids too. You know, it could be just one day or, you know, like movement breaks, for example. So I think what you are saying is really spot on and exactly the kind of um, district that we want to be. Really good points. Uh, Mrs. Charlotte. Just anecdotally, um, I, I would invite anyone here to um, go visit any of the three or four, four elementary schools. When you walk into the three lower elementary in particular, you'll find classrooms that have yoga balls, they have standing, um, standing desks or desks that are adjustable, they have wobbly seats, they have crates, they have wobbly mats, wobbly seats on purpose mats on, yeah. mats on the floor and in particular when I had gone to to Finland to look at their their um, style of <clears throat> presenting a classroom it really compelled me to really address and, uh, and adopt this approach to seating and I commend the the administrators because there are some really creative classrooms and I would love for you to go visit them to see some of the ways that we're starting to transition from the typical re replacing a desk and a chair. 
and I also wanted to be clear, I don't think that neither one of us were implying that that's not being done oh, at all, but just yeah. that we are continue to be innovative in providing those opportunities. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, I don't, so yeah, you're, you're recycle, wow, usually I hit that, sorry. But your recycling doesn't call out the how much more you have to pay for what you're getting to make those environments happen. And I think so as you're, you've, you've done a very consistent job of asking for so much money, we know it's going to go, it's not going to go very far, knowing what you're doing to accommodate those environments to do so. So with that, you know, just I think breaking it out and then knowing what we do for those adaptive um, structures are going to be more important for us to be able to, to long-term fund appropriately. And then we know those are going to wear out too, and you're going to have to replace those at an even higher level. So, so no, I totally get it. Can I just ask a question that it, it extends across two budgets? <laughs> so how does that translate? This is sort of a budget question, but also just like a how does this work question. And you all might not be able to answer this. It might be for somebody else. I don't even know. But how does that translate? Like once they get from elementary, does that extend up? I'm assuming on some level it, it, it ends up at the upper elementary. Does it end up at the middle school? I only asked because I was the mom that was like, hello, Mrs. Hardy. Um, your child again couldn't stay in a seat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and he needed that. At the middle school, I remember saying, like, when I went to Hudson and walked into a classroom and there was a standing desk, I was like, oh, I know a kid who would have used this in middle school. But they didn't have it at the time that I know of. You know, it was more like, well, we just let him get up and roam around the room. And I was like, okay. So like, do are we carrying that forward? And if we aren't, that's, that's something that I'll just like make a mental note of for the future uh, in thinking about preparing a budget message saying, like, we want to extend that kind of seating all the way up to whatever degree we can and whatever degree makes sense. May, may I just say just f from my own personal experience that Oftentimes, the furniture does not tend to move with the child, uh, for example, like a, a support person might, uh, only because of the increasing nature of the uh, of behavioral issues and um, needs of, of uh, children in mm -hmm. terms of movement, uh, both within and out the classroom. So there's a less of a propensity, uh, Jenna, for furniture to move uh, compared to sometimes uh, staffing. Yeah, and I don't mean literal move, but I just mean that the whole mindset about how we design classroom and provide these alternative op options mm -hmm. for seating, do those exist at every level throughout the school district, or is it really mainly at the elementary level? No, th those don't exist at, at all levels. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay. Good. All right. Any so other I, questions? Yeah, there are just a couple more. Okay. Um, so from Chairperson Guayumi and Vice Chair Rothhouse, um, MES and RFS have different budget line items. Um, this is the postage line. MES of 960 and RFS and TFS, schools of approximately um, different numbers, have 1698 respectively. And so I will turn this one to Assistant Superintendent for Business, Matt Chabonel. Yeah, what I did in to calculate that is to just look back on history and just look at, you know, what a three-year average was. So I just picked it off of actuals. Um, sometimes schools, depending upon their structure and what they do, use more postage than others. Sometimes, um, you know, they, they don't in the last three years. Even the COVID year, um, you know, it was it was fairly constant, so... That was something that was just picked up off of uh, a three-year actual of expenditures. So. Okay. Um, and then the last question comes from Board Member Barnes, and this is just specific to MES and the addition of a behavior specialist in our building. Um, the question is, how have you managed without a behavior specialist? I do not see a change in the behavior specialist line item to show there was a delta. Was this an unfilled position or a newly established one, as the superintendent's message makes it seem? There seems to be a critical need for this role. My position on this is that we should look to fill this role in the current school year and continue funding this position in the upcoming fiscal year. 
So in the past years, MES has relied on the teacher of students with emotional disabilities for supports. The special educator has also been the lead teacher in our PASS program, the program for academic and social success. And due to the increasing social emotional needs of our students, it is no longer sustainable for one educator to play both roles. This year, services has hired a behavior specialist using con contracted services position to MES um, with this budget. And if you need further clarification on funding, I would turn to Matt. Yeah. Um, you recall um, last, uh, last year, 2021, when, when we did a uh, closeout of the year, we brought in a $8.1 million surplus. A lot of that was surplus in um, rehires that we had, um, the inability to hire lots of support staff, including custodians, food service workers, paraprofessionals, teachers, um, professional staff. Uh, but in this, in this budget here that we're currently in and the one we're going to be in next year, we are expecting a, a personnel savings of probably around $230,000, $240,000 a year due to uh, rehires and retirements and people leaving the field and coming in at a lower level. So there is room at the end to fund that position currently out of this year's operating budget that we already have. <clears throat> and there'll be room next year without an increase in that line, in any lines as far as the totality of the $21 million teacher's budget when you add all the salaries together. So through re rehires, resavings, and, uh, savings, and uh, existing staff versus last year's staff. In both years, there's, there's room to hire that position. Oh, I, I wasn't worried about the room. I just looked at the line item itself, and it just showed it was not increased by no. Ahead. No. To keep the bottom line the same on mm -hmm. the teacher's salary, it was, it was just left there. It can be pulled from, let's say, a combination of MES, RFS, and TFS for their regular ed teachers. Mm -hmm. There could be money moved from those line items to the line item that would be that behavior specialist. And that's Plus exactly what role. I was looking for uh, because it looks like there was not an addition of a head in that role. No. And I think we want to be transparent in the book just to show an addition of the head in that role. And if it does come out of a teacher line item or whatever, as long as it, everything is whole and accurate, that's fine. You know, surplus notwithstanding, I just think that we want to make sure the funding is always shown to be there for this position because it is that critical. And, and not having it there or showing the increase or the, making that spot whole, um, I just doesn't, doesn't show that we've actually truly committed to funding it from a from a documentation standpoint once we're, you know, once we're out of the season. Well, that would be, that would be something that I would imagine that uh, the board really hasn't done this in the past, but it is common practice in other districts to do line item tra transfers. Mm -hmm. You do have the legal authority per RSAs to do that. So if you wanted to fund that position and put it in the appropriate line, you would just direct me to, I, I could give you the figures and yeah. take it from a multitude of lines and then just allocate it, transfer from those, these three lines into these three lines to create the position. I, I, and I think I would that position that. just needs to be documented every which way possible in, in our ranks and in our budgets. So as we go into future budgets, if you win the lottery and, and you're not here next year because you're on a beach, that we all can, can look at this. And I'm, I'm very hopeful for all of us. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but on that note, you know, that we always have that, that position uh, it, it's not just financial it's substantial and backing that position as far as us putting that money there yeah so I, I think it's important because we're in a contract year mm -hmm. in order to be be truthful to the default budget mm -hmm. I left all the salaries the exact same okay so per the MS 22 this is where they all landed okay and so this is where the salaries are but if you want to make per RSA, whatever it is, I can look that up. I don't have it off the top of my head. A line item transfer, you can do that. Okay. Jenna. Um, 
It says that this year special services hired a behavior specialist using contracted services. Is that is is that because we weren't able to hire one permanently? So the behavior specialist is not in this year's operating budget. They oh, have oh, one oh, at oh, the I other see. schools. We have not had one at MES. Oh, I see so due to needs this year, we were able to secure someone through different funding. Okay. That answers my question. I just want to say one thing. Uh, Lori. So I just want to thank you for taking your mask off. It's really for me, I am hearing impaired, but I can read lips. I'm working on getting a cochlear implant. It was sudden hair loss in both ears. So um, that's why Cinda asked people to do that because it just helps me. That's why we're reading everything. It's just been very difficult, but thank you. I apologize. So this does conclude the elementary school's questions that we've received from the board. Thank you for giving the opportunity for us to be here tonight. And if you have any other questions, we're happy to take them. Uh, questions from the board? Any other? Jenna. So mine is actually just a uh, nuts and bolts question. I did send in a question. Thankfully, it was the question that somebody else asked, and it <laughs> wasn't in here anywhere. It's a, it did go to somebody somewhere. You guys got my question, right? Just making sure you got the other ones, because my other ones... Tonight, my question was covered by other people, so I'm good. I just want to make sure you got the other ones I sent. Yes? Yes. We, okay, I, great. We received, there was one, we received one email uh, with questions from you. If oh, the, well, then you missed my first one. That's fine. We're good. It, uh, was, it was, they answered my, they asked my question, so I'm good. So that, I must okay. have, it's probably in my drafts folder, if we're being honest. I probably thought I sent it, and I didn't. Don't ask. You know, it's been a week, so. But I, you got my long one that didn't include stuff for tonight, but it included stuff for. Included maintenance. Perfect, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's that. the more important one, because the, the other one was covered tonight. Perfect. Okay. Great. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Thank you all for coming out on this very busy week. You know, we all know it is, and hopefully you'll get some. T nice time with your families and some rest in just a couple of days so thanks again i wish you a really nice holiday thank you you did an excellent job thank you. um next up is the task force discussion Thank you very much. Um, in discussion with um, interim uh, superintendent Bill Olson and with members of the leadership team, we've really looked to um, determine next steps for, for um, what we can do to help bring about a vision and um, a, kind of a proposal for a portrait of a learner and the things that will help with curriculum development in the, in the long run. Curriculum development is often based on the tenets of defined visions and goals and um, input from persons that represents the community effort towards what we want our schools to look like. In the last couple of board meetings, it has been brought to our attention that there is really a, um, an interest on the board's part to um, look at creating some kind of a committee. So this is a draft proposal, nothing more than a draft proposal, but it's a way to identify and to to address that, that ask, which I think is a really important ask because without that, it's very difficult to move forward with curriculum revisions. So the Merrimack School Board and the leadership team proposed to bring key constituents together to identify shared values, priorities, and visions for our educational systems, schools, and students. That's been a, a, stated, a stated ask and a stated um, request. Um, and so I really am just taking the opportunity to frame that request and to offer uh, some maybe possible next steps that we could take. So the proposal would be to create a task force and look at a, um, perhaps a, a composition of, of who that would be. And um, certainly we would want members of the school board. We would want, I mean, I, what I'm saying is representatives because everybody's voice would be heard. Everybody's voice on the school board would be heard. 
um, but if we could have on this specific task force that would be guided hopefully by a consultant or facilitator, we would have leadership members, obviously, the assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction, myself, um, and other um, representatives from the leadership team. Staff members, we would want the voice of high school students and parents, and that's been stated at prior school board meetings is to have um, an invitation from parents. We also feel that it's important to have a few business representatives that would reach out as par as business representatives would reach out to the community and then be the voice that comes back to this task force. And we would hope that we could um, have this work guided by a facilitator or consultant. Um, most likely a facilitator that would just help facilitate the conversation as opposed to a consultant that comes with a prepackaged um, uh, kind of uh, s steps or proposals. We would really want to have this be very generic and um, have it really represent Merrimack, be very specific to that. Some of the resources to consider would be the supports for a quality school system. You saw that when we um, identified key qualities that we would want our budget built on. Um, in March, two years ago, we had a team that looked at a reimagining plan for um, Merrimack School, and we have that PowerPoint that was um, led by, well, Bill Wilmot was part of that and was also part of the DOE ask for us to be looking at what, how we, could we reimagine you know, at contemporary education and um, what would be the pillars that would be part of that. Looking at the um, Merrimack High School is currently doing a vision of a graduate per their NEASC uh, um, requirements. And we would want any of this work, this vision to be um, representative of what that vision is for the, the graduate. We also are in desperate need of creating a portrait of a learner. That work began a, um, a year and a half ago and got stalled because of COVID, um, but we have some really good, um, some really, just some great ideas and um, some work that's already been done towards that. Um, we would look for you know prior leadership inputs. We'd look at um, other model strategic plans and resources, inputs from staff and stakeholders, um, ha have this task force engage in some professional readings in addition to that, we would look at creating a timeline. This is just a this is just a mock timeline. It's not this is this needs to be vetted by the school board and um, by uh, the task force. But we were looking at maybe defining some really high level goals for task one, task two, and task three, with a milestone being the the launching point by which we would really have this um, vision vetted by the public and that it could start to be the pillars of by which we move forward and vet other initiatives. Um, with a goal of September 2022, that may be way too ambitious, but um, you're looking at what, about nine, uh, nine months and um, nine meetings that we could have as almost um, just you know, really intensive meetings where we're really working together, but we could also have subcommittees that are breaking off and doing some of the work. So really this, what I really wanted to do here is just capture um, what it is that has been proposed and start to um, offer that we could begin this work in January. Um, it's not to be vetted tonight. It's, um, you know, nor is it to be voted on. It's just my attempt to try to put a framework around what has been asked. Shannon. I, I had a couple of notes. And the first was on your um, composition of the committee. And you have five parents. And we have six schools. I was just wondering if maybe we should be looking at six, so that way there'd be a, a representative from each building. Excellent suggestion. And then um, have I know at our last meeting we talked about the district parent group. Have has anyone reached out to them? Because that's your kind of your built-in. Um, they're all your PTG presidents, you know. And I know that you're familiar with with a lot of them from your time as a principal. But you know, they're, they're representatives in each school already, and it's them. And they may be if they're not the right person, the first 
line of defense to get you that right person in, in a couple of weeks because that's all you really have. Um, so just some thoughts to consider, but make it even a, a shoot off of the district parent group. And if they want to send a delegate for that specific work, then they can do that. But uh, and again, I think that the district parent group was historically run by the superintendent uh, to kind of keep those parents connected with the district and, and the initiatives and then, you know, working with, you know, they do have, you know, we cover everything from fundraisers to exchange of ideas to kind of comparing of notes and it helped the superintendent to, to kind of get a feel for where things are because those parent teacher group presidents are the ones that are probably the most knowledgeable of the things going on in the building, I would have to say. Um, so they're almost built in. And then when you talk about the consultant um, or facilitator, which I, I definitely see a facilitator kind of moving things along and, and guiding the conversation, have you, because you're saying January, have you identified who you may want to consider? And is there a cost to the district and do we need to do anything to help you with that? Thank you for all those um, comments. It's clearly you've read this in advance. I, and well, I do my homework on weekends. I appreciate I it do, so much. Every time. And for your thoughtful thinking. And again, this is not my thinking. This needs to be collective thinking. Oh, so sure. I definitely like your suggestions. Um, I am leaning towards a facilitator, and I would like to get someone who is familiar with Merrimack. And yes, there would be a cost. And um, I was thinking that we might be able to take this out of some ESSER funds sure. for, for moving forward. Um, I think it would be foolhardy for us to go th to, into this without having a facilitator mm -hmm. and someone really knowledgeable. Bill Wilmot comes to mind because he has done so, so much work and, and mm -hmm. UDL would be an important part of um, seeing this vision through. But that's, that's premature for me to state because um, we have not gotten to that point. This no. is just a very, very, very first step towards framing what's been asked. But I think an excellent suggestion off the cuff, so... Thank you. And I, I mean, I like the idea, again, I think you brought this up before, is really tapping to our district parent group. Mm -hmm. And we already have school board representation. We already have that as a standing committee. So maybe it's just a way to revise and really um, get the best efforts from that, that parent group. Um, and you know, I think to Shana's point where all six schools will be represented is a, a good point as well. Um, I know, Lori, you had a couple comments. So. I just want to say I think this was exceptional work. This is exactly, it's not a home run, it's like a grand slam. You know, so many people want to get involved and it's all about collaboration. It's not about isolation. And so the more we can collaborate, the more we can bring people together. You know, um, if the COVID-19 taught us anything, it ta taught us that there's a lot of people who have a lot of passion about education. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing how this task force plays out. And I appreciate your work because I know how hard it is. So thank you. Thank you, Lori. I do have Hi. a question for you. Um, no, wait, Lori. Lori Peters. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and I have a couple so. comments, but Kimberly, go ahead. And if you were about to say something, go ahead. Well, I did want to say back to Lori Rothhouse, thank you very much. And I also wanted to say that given budget season, if February start time might be a better start time. So I wanted the board to weigh in on that. So yes, thank you. Go ahead, Lori. A couple comments. I agree with Lori. This is great. This is what the board has wanted. We've wanted a new vision, mission, and strategic plan. A couple of thoughts though, um, let me go back to the consultant facilitator. Really, we need someone unbiased, familiar with Merrimack, yes, a non-stakeholder unbiased is really the better way to go because they can hear clearly each constituent group and really be able to pull all that information together in a way where sometimes each constituent group might not hear each other very well. So I, I think that should be considered in our who for that. Also, I love the makeup of the task force. That's awesome. Um, but part of the strategic planning process is for that facilitator to meet separately with each constituency, constituency group. For example, uh, the school board is <clears throat> the, the legal body that represents the guardrails for that vision, mission, and strategic plan. So there needs to be work with just the school board. There needs to be work just with the leadership team. And then each of those constituents needs to work with that facilitator. And then that consultant group comes together and, or that 
sorry, the task force comes together as each group and works alongside each other. So there's there's kind of another layer there that we want to make sure in our timeline we have that laid out um, well so that we don't get too bogged down with those needed steps in the nine month time frame. Thank you for that input. I appreciate it. And I think probably a next step would be to take those um, various tasks that we've identified um, and say what would be really important in that. And clearly that, that task one, you know, to really set some high goals for that. And that would be to meet separately with the constituents, you know, meet together and then come up with a plan and then, you know, break out. So I, I appreciate that input. anything else I mean I would like to say thank you very much for bringing this to the board and you know what I love most about this is you're bringing it in a collaborative nature um, so that we really can come up with um, different ideas and you know how to evolve um, your idea without everything being you know a hundred percent together but being able to say hey let's have a discussion and then let's evolve that discussion into some next steps so I really, really um, appreciate that. I find that very refreshing. And I just thank you for your time and pulling that together and getting that in front of us so soon. Um, next. next is the board's response to Snow Day recommendation. Thank you. Um, recently we had a uh, discussion with the members of the leadership team on how we wanted to handle uh, snow days, um, any type of day that uh, instruction and attendance at school might not be possible. As you uh, recall, last year, uh, school systems changed their models of teaching and learning um, to address the COVID issues, to the hybrid, remote, or some combination uh, thereof. And so they were scaled up to address days that uh, there was snow and ice or inclement weather of a, any type that um, might eliminate staff and students from attending school on that particular day. This year certainly is different. Um, we are back to the in-person model of teaching and learning, uh, thankfully. And it becomes uh, more difficult to scale up for remote instruction for, for one day only. Uh, because we are in the in-person model. Uh, so we are proposing to you that we have traditional snow days, no school days, uh, when inclement weather um, makes it unsafe for both our staff and students to attend school. Um, the Department of Education requires school systems in New Hampshire to be in attendance for 180 days, but it also has an instructional hour requirement of 990 hours at grades 7 through 12, 900, 945 hours at the elementary level. Based on the length of our school day, and if you net out you know, passing times at uh, the upper grades, lunchtime, um, and knowing that the state allows for 30 minute recess to count towards instructional hours. We meet those requirements um, after about 175 days. And so we do have a little bit of play if we use the instructional hour approach. And so I'm gonna recommend that to reduce the level of anxiety of families, to reduce the level of anxiety of our staff and students, to allow um, us to provide access to instruction that is, um, that is at a greater equity level because at some, sometimes some students with remote learning uh, do not necessarily access the curriculum as well as we might hope. And so I think this will work out better for everyone. Uh, I do think we have enough play in terms of the instructional hours uh, that uh, we are required to, uh, to provide. So that's my recommendation to you is that we we do not proceed with remote days on days of inclement weather where no one will be in attendance, uh, but we have a traditional no school day. Now I did, have, uh, did participate in a meeting with other area superintendents last week. Uh, many of them are doing the same thing because 
once again, we are not in that remote uh, hybrid model so that technology is not necessarily home for every student. Teachers uh, will require some time to prepare and on a day's notice, that becomes very difficult. So hopefully you'll, you'll approve uh, this approach and if so, I'll send the word out to the community and to the staff uh, tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, Shannon. Have we actually tried to survey parents as well on what their preferences were? Because we have, over the years, collected a lot of data as far as their access to computers, which is obviously moot right now because they all do access to internet, access to internet when they are in daycare, things like that. Because I know that we always get that concern that at the end of the year that the classroom um, environment is just too oppressive. It's it's hot. It's sticky. The ventil. I mean, we're improving ventilation here and there, but again, it's not air conditioning. It's just mm -hmm. improving air quality within that hot temperature. Um, and so, with that, you know, I think we've always tried to take those data points, but have we actually surveyed our parents on if there were remote school in lieu of snow day, would your child be attending? So that way we actually know that, you know what our potential attendance is. Now I think what you're saying, like if I understood correctly, is that we'd be able to offer a traditional snow day, mm -hmm. the way families know it, kids go out and play, whatever. That's correct. And that it wouldn't impact the end of the school year. Well, I, I think we could have upwards of five, five days mm -hmm. and okay. still have well, the so same, push, push. same ending date to the school right. year. It would push it out, those we, MU days are, yes. are yeah, back we, in play. Yeah, because we do know that the, right. the days at this time of the year are more productive than the, the days in, in late June. There's no question about it. But we do have that play in terms of, I've checked with the mm -hmm. elementary principals, middle and uh, secondary in terms of number of hours uh, that are spent on instruction, time on learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we're pretty safe there. Right. And, and I think that the MU days are of great angst and contention with, with families historically. My question being, can we find a happy medium where there's X number of instructional hours, maybe from, say, 8 to 11, and then, you know, you just wouldn't have a full six-hour day, but we could get some instruction in place with on Zoom the way we've been, you know, when we did peak COVID. But, again, it's not like, you know, I, I looked at the packet, and the packet just described to me what was put in place when, it was about you know blizzard bags, and there wasn't one-to-one -one devices to students. And I think that there's a, there's somewhere in the middle is, is I think where where the solution might lie, where they can get a couple of hours of school in, but not spend the whole day on Zoom, and still get what you're looking to get accomplished. May I just say one of the uh, complicating factors, uh, Shannon, is that the the uh, DOE requires that. 80% or more mm -hmm. of staff and students participate. That mm -hmm. sometimes is, is challenging. Uh, to be credited for a school day, pretty much we have to have um, learners in action for three and a half, at least three and a half hours uh, during the day. Um, you know, to address that, I guess what I'd say is that let's, uh, my recommendation is let's start out like this. I mean, if we have eight, nine snow days, which is a rather atypical, then maybe I come back to you with a revised plan at some point in the winter. Uh, that is what some other school systems are doing also. They're saying, well, you know, we'll go through four or five days because they have school years very similar, certainly to ours. Uh, and if, it, if the number of days is mounting, uh, then we may address it a little bit differently down the road. I agree with you 100%. And I think, you know, after everything last year and, you know, kids being inside, let kids be kids, let them have snow days. And I, to your point about survey, though, I think it's a good point. When we do our annual survey about mm -hmm. the upcoming next year, that might be a good chance to ask a couple questions um, to parents. But, I mean, I, I feel very strongly in support of your recommendation um, because I just think, you know what, kids just need to be kids. And this is a, a perfect example. Um, Jenna? I, I was just going to say... Um, it, you know, from an elementary parent perspective, I, you know, I, I, I guess we're one-to-one. -one. Are we one-to-one? -one? I'm not a thousand percent sure we're one-to-one. -one. All I know is that one device that belongs to my elementary school student, I never see it. Right. So if she were to come home with it that day, there would be a gigantic learning curve for me on this one rant. I mean, I'm an educator. I, you know, this is what I do, but still it would come home to me and, and I'd have to be like, okay, 
<laughs> how do you log in? <laughs> like, what's your password? How do yeah. we get onto the whatever? You know what I mean? And so that's for me. I mean, we're talking about other parents that that may be fighting totally different situations, more difficult situations. Maybe they're not home. I just think that the burnout is real across the board. Educators, students, we're all feeling it still from the pandemic. As normal, normal as things have been, it hasn't really felt normal in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that trying to pivot and go remote, I guess is what I'm saying, I think would be extremely challenging for students and parents, like you said, on a one-off snow day, that I, I'm, in, I'm in agreement. And I think originally I definitely was like, let's do the swap day. I want to get out earlier in June. And I still want to get out earlier in June. Anything we do to make that happen. But I think we really, these blizzard days to make everybody's stress levels mm -hmm. drop and not be so stressed about being able to get on Zoom and be and how terrible would it be if we would called these remote days and then we didn't hit, hit that 80% threshold? Then that day wouldn't even count for all that stress. That's my biggest concern. Well, and even how do you calculate the 80%? Yeah. You because take then you put more burden on educators and you don't, what classes had 80% and how does it calculate up to the total and how do we know it was really 80% to meet the state requirements? Just sounds like an administrative burden for a couple, you know, a few days a year. Yeah. Um, but, uh, Lori? So, so I'd like to make a motion that we accept the administration's recommendation for a traditional snow day schedule. Do I have a second? Yes. May I just say also yeah. that you voted on um, an approach to this on April 5th of last year. And so I think what you need to do is have this replace what you voted on as a swap day on April 5th of, of last year. I believe we included that in your in your packet, if I recall correctly. Thanks. thanks. I'd also like to chime in on this. Um, I agree that you know five snow days that would be a blessing for students and the teachers, but I think the policy should have a conditional clause that if we reach those snow days, we readdress this issue because I was. I was flipping through Facebook on this weekend and what was last weekend but the ice storm of 2008. And we lived in another town, but our kids lost 13 days of school and only got five of those waived. So I, I think we need to give ourselves and the public um, heads up that if we have a ton of snow days, we're gonna revisit this so that we're not getting out so late in June. So I'm going to update the motion to replace the four or five motion from last year. And I think we can easily say that that would be a disclaimer, like we've just said publicly. I don't know that we need that in the motion, per se. But I think you would just come up with a future agenda item to revisit it if we find we're stacking the, the dates. Agreed. I agree. Do I have a second to, will you update your second? No, your second? My second. Okay. Yeah, I will. All right. Um, any other discussion on the topic? Um, I, I'm going to vote opposed only because I think that this would be something that would be better voted upon once we actually survey parents. Okay. All those in favor? I'm sorry. Jenna, how do you vote? In favor. Shannon? Opposed. In favor. Lori Rothhaus in favor. Lori Peters? In favor. I vote in favor. That carries 4-1-0. May I ask who seconded that motion? Jenna. Jenna, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the advise and confer update. School uh, safety. School safety. Oh, sorry. A school safety update, sorry. <laughs> yes, um, we uh, have a, a subcommittee of administrators put together uh, to review our current uh, uh, school safety manual uh, our flip charts and our practices and procedures uh, we will be meeting regularly we will involve the uh, police department and the fire departments also in that uh, in that process and so uh, one of the one of the issues that we'll be looking at also is uh, planning with the police and uh, fire departments for Alice training for both our staff and our and our students and uh, we'd like you to participate in that also. Uh, we don't have a firm date on that yet, but uh, we will plan on that, uh, plan that through our committee meetings, uh, which start right after the beginning of our return from uh, the vacation week. 
Okay, questions? Jenna. I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you for your quick action on that, for taking that so seriously. I mean, I think we've learned over the last two weeks, three mm -hmm. weeks, how long has it been, how serious that is and how important that is, and I really appreciate you acting quickly on that. Well, thank you. One of the things uh, we've stated to the staff several times this year is, you know, school safety was somewhat put on the back burner last year because of the nature of instruction. It's back on the front burner and has to remain on the front burner. Couldn't agree more. All right, on to the next item, advise and confer update. Um, advise and confer is an agreement between administrators and the district. It is not a collective bargaining agreement, um, so it's not a warrant article, but it is subject to negotiations. The agreement um, has been um, negotiated over this fall, and it will be voted on later in tonight's agenda in item number eight on the consent agenda. There's key items to note under the agreement that I wanted to publicly state. One is that a market analysis was led by our Director of Human Resources to evaluate our administrators' salaries in relation to other comparable districts in our area. As a result of um, these results, the board did make a market correction adjustment um, to uh, many administrators effective this year. This agreement is also um, a three-year deal that would provide the following key items. Um, effective 7-1-2022 one, um, and then for three years, like I had said earlier. Um, there's a 3.25% increase each year. The recipients will agree to increase their health cost share increase, which would lower district expenses um, by 2% by the end of the contract term which is, again, the three years. Um, the board has agreed to an additional $500 that it will, the district will contribute towards retirement for the recipients in the match section of the agreement. Um, so administrators would have to um, put that money forward um, before it's matched. In number four, um, there is an educational attainment um, amount that will be given each year of the agreement to um, those administrators that have either their CAGS or their PhD. It's a $1,000 or $3,000 um, addition each of those three years, uh, again, for those that have the attainment of their CAGS or the PhD. Um, so I just wanted to be able to put that out publicly um, and make the public aware of those details. Cinda, can I just, as a point of clarification, say a CAGS is short for Certificate of Advanced Graduate Study, so it's beyond master's. Thank you. You're welcome. Get used to the acronyms and then, you know, <laughs> like anywhere else, acronyms. Yes. We're in the bubble. Yeah. We're in the bubble. <laughs> Something we hear, but yeah, thank you for that clarification. All right, so we will um, move on to others. Is there any other new business that we need to discuss? No? Okay. Um, approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion to accept the minutes made by Shannon? Do I have a second? Made by Jenna? Any updates, changes, or comments? No. Um, Jenna, how do you vote? In favor. In favor. <laughs> Shannon? In favor. Lori Rothhaus? In favor. Lori Peters? In favor. And I vote in favor too. That carries 5 0 0. Um, the consent agenda. Um, Kim Yarlett? Yes, we have one item for the consent agenda, and we have received a resignation, letter of resignation from Heather O'Connor. She is currently um, the past teacher at Merrimack Middle School, and that would be um, effective immediately. And then the advice and confer agreement. Yeah, on the consent agenda. Yeah. Shannon? I move to accept the advice and confer agreement and the, education, uh, the educator resignation as presented. And do I have a second? Made by Jenna. Uh, Jenna, how do you vote? In favor. Wait, I just have a, oh. a point of clarification. Yeah. Um, uh, Assistant Superintendent Yarlett said effective immediately on the letter. It has January 21st, 2022. Just clarifying when that is effective. I don't have it. In favor. Uh, my apologies. I'm going to have to check on that exact date. Um, I, I, in the, her letter, it does say 
what is it, January 21st, 21st. 21st. Um, and let's go with that date, and if it's otherwise, I'll be back in touch with you. Okay. Thanks, Lori. Peters? Jenna, how do you vote? In favor. Shannon? In favor. Lori? In favor. Lori Peters? In favor. And I vote in favor, 500. Now we're on to other committee reports. Does anybody have any committee reports? Correspondence. I actually do have a committee report. Okay, go right ahead. <laughs> the uh, Greater Woods Subcommittee did meet. Um, it was, gosh, last week. <laughs> and we are going to be meeting every other month. Uh, so uh, we'll be meeting again in February and then again in April. So with that, um, as I've said on a couple of occasions, I'm not running for re-election. So um, we'll have to do some succession planning for that committee. I've been on it since it started. And it does have 50 acres of property that abuts, that, that is owned by the school district and is adjacent to Merrimack Middle School. A lot of the town owned property also is up to and including the outdoor classroom. So with that, we're finalizing the, um, the, the master plan. And there are some projects that we went through that we wanna get done in the next, uh, in the next year or so. Uh, the outdoor classroom is one that I think is very important for the school district. And uh, there has been vandalism, including a, a hole that was kicked into the roof of it by, um, by some youth. Uh, so with that, we, um, we have some work to do, but it's an asset that the school district gets, can take great advantage of because it is pretty much right off campus, like by a couple of feet. Uh, but it's on, it's on town property. So with that, um, something we want to consider is we're you know, trying to get some, some help from, from the district. We get a lot of value back from it. Um, and then there's going to be some trail work and all that good stuff just to keep things up and, and, uh, and safe. So uh, again, meeting in February, and then uh, the April meeting, by that time, it will not be uh, the board representative. Thank you. Um, any other committee reports? Correspondence? Comments? I have, I have one comment. So um, my neighbor, who I walk with every day, decided to take bill up on his less sub for 10 days to be a good citizen. So she is loving it. And I lost my walking partner, but she <laughs> has subbed every single day and she's having so much joy. I'm telling you, she's loving it. That's awesome. That's great. <laughs> Any other comments? All right, public comments on agenda items. Are there any public comments? I'm just going to note while he's coming up, there are no emails this evening. Okay. Chuck Mower, Ford Depot Street. I w was wondering if someone could explain to me how social and emer um, emotional learning is going to be handled as a new initiative. I mean, traditionally, teachers have always exercised good judgment about social and emotional learning, but in this new initiative, is it going to be treated as a matter of the classroom curriculum delivery, or is it going to be a pod of some kind for professional development um, outside the classroom? Um, How is it going to be handled, and what kind of cost is associated with it? Would one of you uh, reach out to Mr. Moore? Yes. Uh, Chuck, I guess my answer would be all of the above. We uh, will be providing professional development uh, to the staff. Just, I mean, we, we don't typically answer the questions. So I just want to be consistent. You know what? I, and I, I have to apologize. No, you're uh, fine. That was a form that I used to use, and it's a tough habit for me to break. No, so you're I fine. Apologize. I would just ask that you reach out to him um, I, with I answers to that. his questions. Or uh, you could stick around afterwards sure. as well. Thanks. Any other public comments? All right. Um, I will accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Made by Shannon, seconded by Jenna. Jenna, how do you vote? In favor. Shannon? In favor. Lori Rothhaus? In favor. Lori Peters? 
In favor. And I vote in favor. Um, that carries 500. Uh, we wish you all a very nice holiday. I wish students, Caitlin and everyone else, a wonderful break. And our teachers, mm -hmm. just a chance to um, to get some rest and spend time with families and, um, and a, a wonderful new year. Uh, we'll see you next year. Good night. Chuck's tired. He was Santa Claus.